message. Send it. But no, because gun, guns, gun ownership has a negative connotation in the black community because of the violence that they bring. Right. And I also think that has something to do with the image that's portrayed on social media as well, taking it back to when we first began, uh, began this conversation. Because but, but Let's think about mm -hmm. this. Even before social media, the 70s, the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, had we ever heard about uh, the NWCP and um, the Second Amendment? Nope. Never. Ever. Even when the Black Panthers were out there on the, uh, the state's, uh, the doorsteps of the state capitol in California. Mm -hmm. You didn't see the, um, you didn't see the uh, NAACP back out there back, back in them? Nope. Not at all. It was it was stigma because you like like I said, you have a lot of groups that only take interest in certain actions whenever it can benefit them. And yeah. the just to have the, the stigma amongst black people, it kinda goes back to that whole mindset of, you know, that's some quote unquote white boy shit. But it doesn't pertain not to say that, you know, that's the reason why they didn't do it. I mean it could be, but at the same time, it's not the majority reason as to why they didn't back uh, the Black Panthers whenever they're on the steps. You know, it boils down to having the best interest of what that organization is trying to seek, and at the same time, um, just that trying to overcome that stigma. Because if it's real easy to say we're going to quash this idea because it doesn't it doesn't align with our belief value our beliefs and our values and what we're trying to achieve but at the end of the day it does because one way or another eventually it will come around um just like you could have easily you could have easily tried to have a campaign against firearms in some of the rougher areas chicago detroit mm -hmm. anywhere if there was better um education as far as guns and the violence they could bring and how to prevent it uh it's it's almost like having a sex ed class and you're not teaching the kids about sex ed or like in some schools you've you've tried to do away with sex ed but yet you don't understand why there's a, a large influx of pregnant teenagers it's are guns pretty no does what they do at the end of the day is that pretty no but at the end of the day, it's still here and it still needs to be talked about and it still needs to be brought to the education of black people or just people in general. Because mm -hmm. I, I honestly, and I'll, I keep saying this to the end of time, this whole um, stop Asian hate thing. If you look at how it's targeted black people and Asian people and basically put us against each other, which to me, I think is is crazy because not to sound like the cliche guy that's like oh you know I've got friends that are Asian but you know I do have friends that are Asian and I do know people that are Asian and anytime I interact with another person of any other culture I still interact as a man I'm not interacting as like a black man like I can't talk to you because I'm black I'm not doing that shit I've dealt with that um, as a matter I've dealt with racism as a matter of fact when I was uh in elementary school back in Texas. Mm -hmm. I've dealt with it on multiple occasions, whether it was me being jumped by a whole group of five, 10, 15 white kids at my uh, daycare, or whether I was told I can't play with these toys because I'm not, because I'm black or um, anything of that area. I've dealt with racism before. Right, but, right. But to me, this whole stop Asian hate thing it comes at a very convenient time because January the 6th, we all remember what happened. This was th this year, of course we remember what happened. We're still waiting to figure out what the justice is on that. Right. But uh, I think it's just convenient that this happens after that. And now we're putting 
black people against Asian people. Mm -hmm. Whereas it shouldn't even be about that. You don't have a lot of, in my opinion, I could be wrong. I don't know, but you don't have a lot of black people going out beating Asian people up on on a regular. But at least that's what social media is going to tell you. Right, right, right. I, I have no qualms with people of any other race. Right, right. But that doesn't necessarily, it shouldn't label me as part of what's going on with that because that's the new push that the media is going for. As a matter of fact, you haven't heard anything about that in a long time, as far as I can remember. Because the thing that took over the Stop Asian Hate movement was what happened in Afghanistan. Because as soon as Afghanistan, the retreat from Afghanistan, or the um, departure from Afghanistan and how that went down, as soon as that hit the news, that's all you've been hearing. So I'm just wondering, I mean, are we still quote unquote hating on Asian people or are we still going to quote unquote war with Asian people or was it just all part of a plan of something bigger? That's mm. just how I'm looking at it. Right, exactly. Well, you know, it's all about the media and you have to be careful of the media because the media could be the devil sometimes, mm -hmm. you know. I honestly think that we need to, um, because it was getting to the point where you they were covering Asian people arming themselves. And if that story would have continued to push the direction that it uh, it was going, at least from my point of view, you were mm -hmm. going to have a lot of increase with hate crimes dealing with black people attacking Asian people with firearms because that's what the media was pushing for and the ulterior motive behind that would have been to push for more gun control because now you've got different racial groups warring amongst themselves which it's just it's part of that dialogue that the, the media is trying to push which is ridiculous you know it never should come to the point where you've got groups of other people of other races so afraid that they don't know what's going to happen amongst themselves whenever they're put with these other people to the point where they start arming themselves. Right, there should right. never be that whole push to light the powder keg and then say, okay, cool, now let's see what's going to happen. We're going to have the black people and the Asian people warring amongst themselves and it's only going to help us get to our, our end goal. Like, no. The, you're not they shouldn't look at these people as pawns because at the end of the day that's how I feel but but that's ultimately what they've been trying to do they've been trying to push these our group versus their group they've been trying to push that ever since um in my opinion Jan uh, January 6th happened just to take the heat off of those who were responsible right 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 I understand. but hey I mean <laughs> I, I mean, what, what do I know, man? I'm just dude behind a microphone, just throwing my thought, my two cents out there. Because at the end of the day, I don't want to hate Asian people. I have no reason to hate Asian people. Right. Just right. like I guarantee you, other black people out there feel the same way. They don't have a reason to hate Asian people. So where this narrative even came from, you know, was ridiculous. As a matter of fact, the last person, the last person to even cause a stir in in that group was when they had the uh, massage parlors get shot up over here in Atlanta. Yeah, yeah. Just throwing that out there, you know? So I, I just, I don't really see a reason to um, even feel like we need to push back and forth between both racial groups. It's ridiculous. It's a, it, it was a poor media narrative and it never should brought up in, but it never should have been brought up in the first place and it never really should have gotten it out of control mm -hmm. the way it did. Yeah, that's what happens when you have a left-leaning media, uh, unfortunately, you know, and, you know, it, it doesn't do anything to bring us all together. It, it only separates us even more. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, you know, one ruling regarding the Second Amendment, it's not just going to affect all the, the Black Second Amendment uh, followers, but it's, or the Asian Second Amendment followers, or the Hispanic, whatever. It's going to affect everyone the same. Right, right. But, you know, I mean, this is, 
as I said <laughs> earlier, this is the world we live in. So, exactly. but but you said you uh, you do have some criminal background history. Uh, what could be the best way to protect ourselves before police even get involved outside of de-escalation? How to protect ourselves? I mean, having situation awareness. You know, use your spidey sense. Use what God gave you. Um, unfortunately, some people don't have that. <laughs> and I say that, but I mean, you got to understand, you know, don't go places or if you're in a place and you can kind of see, like for me, I can already kind of see things ahead of time. Or let's say if a fight is about to happen, mm -hmm. you know, I'm backing up. Or if I'm going to a restaurant, I always see, sit to where I'm facing the exit, you know, no matter, and I like to look at where the exits are when I go into a, uh, an establishment, you know, because I need to know where I need to retreat at in case something goes down, you know, right. I'm looking at people that's coming in, paying attention to people, you know. Uh, so you got to have your, your you got to have your head on the swivel, and you got to have good situation awareness regarding your and stop get out the, the dog on cell phone, cell phone, cell phone. I tell people can save your life or kill you too at the same time, you know. Um, uh, um, Stop looking at the cell phone, you know, pay attention to things that don't look right to you. And trust me, if something doesn't look right to you, there's a good chance that it ain't something, it ain't right. And, you know, and again, you know, I, I like to, before I even go into um, a restaurant or, a, or frequent a, a place that I'm going to, I always make sure that I look at you know, everything that's going on outside, you know, when I get in, I want to look at the, the atmosphere, the mood of, you know, the people inside, you know, stay away from people that may cause you trouble, bring you trouble, mm -hmm. um, or, you know, just say, hey, you know what, I'm not going to go into this establishment this day or this area this day, I'm going to, you know, I'll go somewhere else, you know, so. I just like to, you know, I always make sure that I'm uh, well aware of my surroundings. Um, and, you know, I stay away from, you know, things that could bring me trouble. And like I say, I've been doing, I'm 51. I've been doing it this, this long in life. So, hey, you know what? I think I'm doing something pretty good. Right. <laughs> good advice. Real good advice. I definitely agree with that. Yeah. So, but you, you were talking about uh, earlier as far as you never heard the NAACP mention anything about firearms, which means that there is probably a lack of unification of, let's just say, a safer black society due to the fact that there is no unification of black firearms. So in your opinion, what would be the best method of creating that unification of black firearms in order to promote a safer black society? <sighs> being educated on the laws, um, safety, training, all of that. Um, just not buying a gun and thinking everything is good at that point. No, you need to you need to be trained. You need to you need to be in grassroots organizations. Um, even right now, I'm in the uh, uh, the sheriff's uh, citizens academy. Uh, it's a 16 week academy where they take civilians get a familiarization with um the department different departments in uh the sheriff's uh organization but also as me being a firearms instructor i am the one that's normally most vocal in class you know letting them know the different firearm rules that most uh law enforcement don't know about and educating them on that. Hmm. So I owe it to them. I owe it to my them. I owe it to my community uh, to let them know that hey, you know what? This is legal and this isn't legal. Like in the state of Florida, we don't have open carry unless 
you're going to or from camping, hunting, or fishing. You wouldn't believe how many law enforcement officials don't even know that uh, statue. So they see somebody out with a, a AR-15 strapped across their chest and they're fishing and they try to violate their rights. Whereas I'm like, look, this person is not um, this person person is not uh, committing a crime. Well, as far as trying to expand the education uh, involving black people and firearms, as well as uh, promoting more chapters and getting them established out in other states. Mm -hmm. But I think if there was more of an increase of that, as well as um, just maybe firearm integration with um, let's just say other racial groups. So like say for example uh, in order to get rid of that whole Asian hate thing, if we were to integrate into a gun club let's just say we had our own black gun club but we had integration meetings with other gun clubs as well uh, I think that would also help out and I think that would keep uh, people more aware of certain changes that are going on that could affect everyone in this uh, community. So like, for, say for example, the, what was it, the brace band that was going on uh, earlier in 2020. Uh, I guarantee you a lot of people didn't know about that whenever it came to uh, black people carrying firearms that had braces on. It. Right, uh, right. The only way you would even know about that is if you kept your ear uh, to the news that was going on. Mm -hmm. Um, but if there was like a black gun club that met up with, I don't know exactly the word to, uh, describe what I'm trying to think of, but to me, it, it kind of reminds me of when I was at Boy Scouts, right? So you had your troop that was made up of people in your neighborhood, but then you would have what was called the, the jamboree, which was a gathering of all the troops not just in that area but it was like uh, all the troops I think in general regarding Boy Scouts so instead of a larger scale like that I'm just saying like you'd have your black gun club you know which would be your local your local troop but then you'd have like a jamboree like let's say for the area of Atlanta so now you not only have your black gun clubs getting together, but you have your other gun clubs getting together as well, because we all know ultimately the thing that is shooting us in the foot, no pun intended, in dealing with the Second Amendment is the fact that you may have that whole racial hesitation, whereas like if I'm black and I join a gun club that's mainly white, mm -hmm. Would I end up dealing with racism or would I end up being welcomed with open arms or would there be a lack of understanding where I'm coming from, from my perspective? Because like I said, there's a CWB aspect. Just because one person in the white gun club can carry this weight doesn't mean that me being the black person that is partaking in this white gun club could carry the same weight. So I think there would be a better understanding of what the pain points are for each racial group in the Second Amendment community and trying to find a, a if not a solution, a compromise, but nonetheless a solution to fix that. Because in all honesty, like I said earlier, the racial separation is not helping anybody. And if anything, it's pre uh, preventing us from being able to step up and stop some of the bigger things that may be coming down the pipe. Mm -hmm. uh, perfect example, I've heard that, I think the channel was CRS Firearms. So it is, is a, a guy that keeps his, uh, his ear to the street on what's going on with the uh, Second Amendment and the ATF. Um, but basically he made it seem like the ATF was going to end up being more so made up of different local sectors. Mm -hmm. So if somebody were to kick your door in right now and they just actually went through with the brace band and they said, you know what? You have this weapon, you weren't supposed to have it. We're gonna go ahead and take you to jail. They could go ahead and boom, right on the spot, say you did this wrong and you're coming with us. Right. right. And 
every single state. So there would be almost like they're gun police, but they have no real ending to their jurisdiction because they get their rules uh, directly from the ATF. Mm -hmm. So if we could actually get together, and I know this is like a, a probably a big, you know, we are the world. I hope this works out type deal. But, you know, honestly, I think starting small, if we had more black gun clubs, more black, like you said, grassroots uh, groups to the point where we had enough of an influence to where we could actually work with other people in other gun clubs. Mm -hmm. I think not only would that have a, a change on safety, <clears throat> excuse me, safety in black society, whenever it comes to firearms, but it would also help us uh, create a more respected image through the unification. But do you think it could, uh, create a more respected image for us if something like that were to happen? I don't know. That's a slippery slope. I mean, you would have to really change the mindset of an entire generation for that, something like that to happen. I mean, people's, people's, at this point, I think that people have in their, their minds that guns are bad and, and dangerous and you know it would it would have to start off from you know a much younger generation going forward for something like i feel for something like that to change yeah but i don't know man because it's really easy to sit back and say guns are bad and dangerous but we also had uh, the president recently say that it wouldn't make any sense for people to go ahead and try and overthrow the government because we have nukes and military and tanks and air, you know, you know, I think if anything, people of all colors should wake up and say, Hey, this don't feel right. <laughs> because yeah. Yeah. To, yeah, to threaten, but, you know, yeah. Unfortunately, you know, some people get stuck in their, their old ways. Yeah, I guess it was just wishful thinking then. I don't know, man. <laughs> <laughs> but right, hey, man, it was good talking with you. Uh, I really appreciate it. Definitely had a great time. Um, is there uh, anything you'd like to say or just let people know how they can get in contact with you or even sign up for a class that you might be giving up? Sure. Um, if you're in the uh, Northeast Florida area, uh, you can go to uh, Scorch Earth Farms Training uh, dot com. You can even Google Scorched Earth Farms Training. Um, you can also go to, you can find me on Facebook, uh, Scorched Earth, Scorched Earth Farms Training on Facebook, on Instagram, and Twitter is uh, all together. So, yeah. And if you thinking about uh, getting a shooting class in, I do that. Uh, I also do a con Florida Concealed Weapons License uh, certification as well. Awesome. I appreciate it. Definitely would love to have you back for some more conversations if you're interested in doing it. Sure. Always. Always. All right, brother. Once again, appreciate it. And it's that time. I'm going to hit y'all with the outro. Once again, this is Yasuke Fett representing the Black Powder Podcast. And this has been another successful mag dump. Catch y'all next time.